Victorian Virtual, Victorian Virtual Emergency Department webinar. I'm Cathy Tepper from Eastern Melbourne PHN and very pleased tonight to partner with Northern Health and Ambulance Victoria to present tonight's webinar. I would like to begin our webinar by acknowledging the traditional owners of the many lands from which we are joining the webinar. I'm joining today from the land of the Wurundjeri people. I pay my respects to elders past and present and to all First Nations people in this webinar. During tonight's webinar, if you would like to submit a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We've turned off the chat function and ability to raise your hand. We will be recording this event and making it accessible on our website. So we have three presenters tonight for our webinar. Um, I would like to welcome Dr. Lauren Scher, who is the Director of the Victorian Virtual Emergency Department and a Paediatric Emergency Physician at Northern Health. Also welcome to Brad, and Ariana, who are from Ambulance Victoria. Thank you, Lauren, Brad and Ariana. Thanks very much. I might just kick off with a brief introduction and um, to the virtual ED, and then I'll hand over to Brad and Ariana as well to just um, take over and discuss their, their very important pieces of work. So um, thank you everyone for this opportunity to present. Uh, so just to give you a bit of background, uh, we started the Victorian Virtual ED back in October 2020 out of the Northern Hospital as part of our COVID response. Um, in the initial iteration of this, we created two pathways, one for patients and one for, for healthcare providers in our Northern catchment, offering them an opportunity to have a consultation with uh, nursing and emergency medical staff and help determine whether they did or did not need to come into hospital and to try link them into other alternative care providers. Uh, we launched our bit of work with Ambulance back in um, October 21, while we were sort of coming out of the Delta wave and going into Omicron. And um, based on the provisional data that came out of this um, proof of concept work, we managed to secure government funding for a statewide model rollout as of February of this year. We're a 24 hour service, uh, which is a 24 hour nurse, um, uh, nurse triage provision uh, that, that services our patient presentation arm. And then from a um, medical perspective, servicing both the patients and the healthcare professionals, we're physician led between eight and 11.30 and at night, and we have a nurse practitioner model overnight. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So just to give you just a very brief overview of those care pathways. So on to the right, or my right, I can see the patient self-referral process where patients can electronically register using a link on our web page. They enter our triage nurse waiting room and um, post that triage, one of uh, four dispositions will be determined. Either they will be referred into hospital urgently, usually facilitating an ambulance uh, call out, or they'll be directed to attend an emergency department within two hours. Alternatively, about 10% of patients are actually extremely well and are referred back to uh, alternative care providers in the community, such as pharmacy, GP, um, GP respiratory clinics. And then the rest of the patients are referred on to our doctor's uh, consult waiting room, where we have a combination of GPs and emergency physicians that will then uh, provide those patients with a consultation. Uh, the AV and healthcare professional pathway works a little bit differently in that it bypasses the triage nurse. So it works using a different link um, and goes straight through to the, the physician's um, consult waiting room. Again, uh, we have various dispositions that we've created for patients. And uh, in many instances, it, we're able to actually keep patients at home. So currently, um, in terms of our self-referral pathway, we manage to keep approximately 70 to 80% of those patients at home, uh, depending on whether they're adult or pediatric or whether they have COVID or don't have COVID. And in terms of our um, healthcare pro professional pathway, um, we similarly have excellent rates of diversion, which I'll get uh, uh, Brad to discuss a bit later when he's presenting the um, ambulance arm. I might hand over to you, Brad. Uh, beautiful, thanks there, Lauren. <clears throat> so um, from a healthcare professional pathway perspective, um, it's not just AB that it can have access. It's, um, it is one of the um, um, 
big contributors and we are a key stakeholder, I suppose, for Victorian Virtual ED. Um, but we've also got the urgent care centres in regional areas, um, residential aged care facilities in local areas, GPs and nurse on call is something that's uh, in the pipeline of something we can look at from an advisory working group um, to make sure that we are, um, or that Victorian Virtual ED is providing um, a good service and um, have buy-in, I suppose, from the different areas. There's been work with residential aged care facilities, uh, GPs like webinars like tonight, um, and also from a paediatric perspective and um, engaging with the Royal Children's Hospital as well. So uh, specifically with Ambulance Victoria Pathways, so the normal call that comes through um, to Ambulance Victoria is obviously through triple zero. Um, we will then um, be triaged by ESTA um, and then um, the two different pathways that AV can access are either if it's uh, dispatched as a time critical or urgent case, then uh, an ambulance will be dispatched to be able to go out and assess in the field. If the patient is deemed appropriate for uh, a Victorian virtual ED um, referral, so they're meeting the inclusion criteria and not meeting any of the exclusion criteria, then our paramedics have the ability to um, uh, refer directly to the Victorian virtual ED and they'd wait on site with the um, patient until uh, the consult's finished and then uh, assist with whatever the um, recommendations are. So if transport is um, recommended, then the paramedics are still there and able to facilitate that if it needs an emergency ambulance. We can also um, organise a non-emergency ambulance or sometimes it's also by private means. Um, but current, uh, current data with ambulance referrals is that only occurs about 25% of the time. So 75% of the time with ambulance referral, um, we are not required and the patient doesn't need to be transported to hospital. The second um, pathway is if um, the call comes through and it is deemed either a non-emergency case or a non-urgent case, uh, we've just commenced, and this is uh, Ariana's work, um, a RACER pathway. So the RACER pathway is residential aged care enhanced response. So in the first phase of the RACER program, um, the patient will go through to our triage services. They'll be assessed um, by the triage services and their decision-making tool. If the patient is deemed to need a non-emergency ambulance, then, and they live in a residential aged care facility, um, the triage practitioners will actually connect um, and assist uh, the nursing staff at the residential aged care facility um, for a virtual ED consult in that pathway. Feel free to jump in, Ariana, if I've missed something on that step. Perfect. Beautiful. So they're the two current pathways that we have with Ambulance Victoria. So um, as uh, Lauren mentioned earlier, we, we commenced um, working with Victoria and Virtual ED back in October. And this graph here shows the uh, number of in-field ambulance registrations um, month by month. So as you can see, um, starting off quite modestly, but we've uh, increased quite significantly as the rollout has um, gone across the state. So um, at this point in time, uh, Metropolitan Melbourne can refer, ambulance can refer both COVID and non-COVID patients. Um, several regional areas can also do the same now. So in Hume, Lord Malley and uh, Grampians, and we've still got a few regions still um, to refer for non-COVID, but we've had COVID referrals um, statewide um, since I believe April. Um, as you can see with the July data there, uh, this is just ambulance referrals for the month, it's just clicked over 3,000 referrals for the month. So we are utilising uh, the uh, Victorian Virtual ED and maintaining that diversion rate of 75%, which is, um, which is quite impressive um, for us and extremely beneficial for diverting ambulances, uh, transporting patients to emergency departments. It also frees us up uh, to attend other cases as well. Um, one of the other benefits that we've had is extending the scope of paramedic practice. So for paramedics to be on site, um, to be able to um, listen to and assist with the assessment with the emergency physicians um, is an educational um, um, an educational benefit for paramedics as well, just to see the kind of questions and stuff they get asked and also the pathways that are appropriate for those patients. And obviously um, a huge thing for us is safety netting. So 
having that shared decision making um, with a, a consultant um, just helps with paramedics um, and safety needing for their patients to get best care. Um, so I pretty much covered this already, but so with that first, um, if an ambulance is dispatched, the way that we can refer through to virtual ED is we would initially conduct our assessments to make sure that it was appropriate for a Victorian uh, virtual ED uh, referral. We make sure that we liaise with family and the nurse, if it's at a um, care facility um, or GP, in particular for GPs um, requested or referred for a patient to be transported to hospital. Um, we we're encouraging our paramedics to make sure that they engage with that GP to ensure um, that they're aware that um, we want to go through a virtual ED consult. So then we can refer um, providing it's appropriate, as I said earlier, in regards to inclusion and exclusion criteria. That's very strict and we make sure our paramedics are aware of that. And then, as I said, we remain on scene to make sure if in that uh, circumstance where the patient does need to be seen in person, uh, we are there to assist if required. And again, that could be transport from um, those paramedics on site or it could be organising an alternate transport as well. Um, so from an exclusion criteria at this point, um, acute mental health, that's the main presenting problem that is uh, that can't be seen by Victorian Virtual ED. If alcohol or drug intoxication is their main presenting problem, um, those two categories are just uh, very high risk, I suppose, from a virtual um, assessment perspective. If the patient is likely to require surgery, um, that is part of the exclusion criteria. So um, specifically, we're looking um, at, say, a NOF in a nursing home, that kind of situation. We want to make sure they get transported and scanned and potential for that surgery. Um, if there's abnormal vital signs, so from a paramedics perspective, we've got red flag criteria. So there's red flag criteria that are specific for age groups in regards to abnormal vital signs. So if a patient has those abnormal vital signs, they, they, um, don't, they say a double negative here, but they don't meet the uh, exclusion criteria. Um, and then we also have specific conditions. So very, uh, paramedics are very familiar with these. These are um, been approved um, as red flag criteria for a number of years before we engage with Victorian Virtual ED. Um, so paramedics are comfortable with that. And the last one there is in regards to uh, patients less than three months as well. Um, do you want me to talk still, Ari? Or you, want to, you want to jump in? Uh, uh, not fast. Yeah, you, no, you can. I'll, I'll keep going. You've got yeah, some yeah. slides. <laughs> so with um, Treehouse Services, um, so as I mentioned before, if a case comes through triple zero, goes to our Treehouse Services and it's deemed, uh, sorry, it goes through to our Treehouse Services, they would perform a clinical assessment over the phone. Um, if the patient um, is then deemed suitable for virtual ED, then the triage practitioners will assist with the registration uh, to complete that registration for the patient. Um, and then once um, they get sent the link um, for the waiting room, uh, awaiting a consult, then that ends their, um, that ends their consult with the triage services. If on occasion uh, following that, consult that the patient does need uh, an ambulance, whether it's not emerge or emerge, then the consultants in the Victorian Virtual ED um, have a pathway to refer back into um, both those streams so that they can get an ambulance for that patient. Um, thanks, Brad. So hi all, um, I'm Ariana. Um, I'm a program lead within the Patient Care Academy here at Ambulance Victoria. So we're really looking at um, uh, system-wide pathways of, and new models of care to um, better connect patients um, to alternative service providers um, and pathways where appropriate. Um, as Brad has spoken about, um, one of the first pathways that the Patient Care Academy is has started, we started four days ago now, um, is the um, RACER pathway. So uh, Brad's really spoken about the kind of steps in, um, in, in how that's undertaken. So uh, we've... We in undercovering this work, and obviously um, you would all be aware the the this group particularly um, being particularly vulnerable and, um, you know, the risks associated with attending an emergency department for this cohort. Um, and what we discovered through this design of this pathway is really the uh, high percentage of patients that are transported to the emergency department um, and that actually a large percentage of these patients are transported via non-emerge ambulance. 
Uh, the other thing that we, I guess, uncovered through this pathway is that a majority of these patients were being triaged by our triage services team in the first instance, and then uh, an ambulance was being dispatched. So the intervention is really within that triage services space so that we can directly refer through to the virtual ED and uh, so they are able to provide that consult with the aged care facility um, and the nurse on site. Um, Similarly to this very similar exclusion and inclusion criteria, um, as Brad has already articulated, um, fitting in within the um, VVED exclusion criteria. Uh, the other thing I would just like to point out is though, we are staging this um, in two parts. So stage one is patients that are, would have required a non-emerge ambulance being referred through to the virtual ED in the first instance. And once we know that this um, pathway has been uh, tested, safety netted, and is working how we are hoping it will work, we will potentially expand into that uh, code two or three uh, cohort, uh, emergency cohort, um, through so that they can refer through to the virtual ED. Um, I guess, you know, again, this is not anything that would be news to any of the people on the line today, but really trying to, you know, this is, you know, trying to be really patient-centred in the best care for these patients in terms of, you know, a lot of the kind of uh, potential risk for hospital-acquired complications for this cohort, um, uh, you know, is quite high. The other aspect that we'll be implementing through the RACER program is the capability and capacity uplift within our triage services team. So there will be an aged care specialist uh, recruited so soon uh, within the triage services team. Uh, that's um, a high level overview of RACER and I think it's back to you now, Lauren. Yeah, so I just wanted to quickly talk about some new work that we recently were asked to launch by the Department of Health. So about two weeks ago, we launched our VVD early antiviral treatment team. Um, essentially, what now happens is that every patient coming through the Victorian virtual ED that is COVID positive will have a, um, a screen for uh, early treatments. Um, this is an electronic screening tool that we've provided to our doctors and nurses, and it essentially it determines whether they're eligible or ineligible for treatment. Um, those that are ineligible uh, will uh, be notified via um, email that they're ineligible for, for treatment, but are given information about recontacting us if their condition gets worse. And those that are eligible are booked into our early treatment clinic. We're then assessed um, by one of the doctors working in that clinic to determine which drug, whether it be Paxivid, um, Molnupiravir or Remdesivir, they're suitable for. Um, and basically, um, once they've had that assessment and prescription within contact the GP um, looking after that patient and we'll email that um, or fax out that uh, discharge summary that you're aware that your patient is has been started on that treatment. Um, just next slide please. Um, and just to sort of uh, give you an idea about sort of the makeup of that team so it's a, a sort of multidisciplinary team that we've put together um, consisting of pharmacists, um, medical, it's a GP-led um, service. So it's a GP and nurse practitioner clinic and obviously administra administra administrative staff uh, trying to facilitate all the faxing and contacting of the relevant stakeholders. And that I think is just a summary of some of the work that we are doing currently in the Victorian virtual ED. Um, and we've all very happily said we'd uh, provide our email addresses if anyone wants to contact us to ask any particular questions or um, gather any further information from us. And that's it. Thanks, Thanks Lauren, Brad and Ariana. That was very interesting and we have a lot of questions to ask you. Um, one of the first questions is, is the virtual ED reached through the Northern Health's website? Yes, yeah, so happy to talk about that. So yes, um, up until next week. So currently, yes, it can be accessed through the uh, Northern's um, website. So if you just Google Northern Hospital Virtual ED, a big icon comes up and you can press that and that'll take you through to the um, referral pathways. It's pretty easy. There's three tiles. One's got an ambulance on it. One says healthcare provider, one says patient, and that takes you to the correct link. And um, we are launching our own domain next week. That's just in fine. Fi it's being finalized um, at end of this week with view to launch next week. And so that um, you can actually just search Victorian Virtual ED and that will come through its own domain. 
And to refer to the ED, do you have to be from a certain local government areas if you're non-COVID? So the work that we've rolled out statewide at the moment is with ambulance and COVID positive pathways. So technically speaking, um, the other work we're doing in a regional basis at the moment, um, any anyone pretty much from the Northeast, because we've been working collaboratively with Austin and St. Vincent's, can um, access our service. And we've recently launched our Hume Pathways as well. So we've been working in the Hume region. Um, we're currently working through the urgent care centers and looking to get to the point where we've rolled out the full extent of the model across the Hume region. We're current, we're, we've just started engagement work with Gippsland and we'll be taking across the various regions. So essentially, um, at this particular point in time, I'd say if you're in the Northeast HSP, you probably have access to most of the service, um, and, but across metro and regional areas outside of Hume, it's very much ambulance and um, COVID pathways to just sort of summate where we're, where we're providing the service. Thank you. Um, could the electronic tool for viral prescribing be shared so it can go on health pathways? Yeah, I'll take it to my the, the person who... Um, who created it, who's one of our pharmacists. I guess one of the issues that we've raised is that the Department of Health keeps changing the criteria and expanding it. So we we obviously in real time um, change that tool. So I'm just, I guess one of the concerns raised is that the electronic tool ends up in various different places and gets used, but doesn't actually, um, hasn't been altered to to meet the new the new criteria. But yeah, you're not the first to suggest that, and I do think it would be helpful um, if we can find a way to sort of update that more readily. So I'll take that on board with our pharmacy team and see if we can get that um, provided, because I do think that would be really helpful, actually. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, do you prefer GP always to be the initial referrer, or is it okay for patients to self-refer? Uh, to be perfectly honest, if I were a GP, I would probably prefer patients to self-refer. I think where we are quite helpful with um, the GPs in sometimes the more complex patients and then just discussing with the GP, with the patient there, the potential options that we can navigate. Good examples of that have been, for example, where we've um, organized for patients to come in next day to short stay and we've discussed mutually what um, investigations we think needs to happen, but we put safety measures in place, for example, to make sure that patient was safe overnight. But generally speaking, if you otherwise think your patient needs to go into ED, um, you're not 100% sure, but they're clinically stable, we're more than happy for patients to just pick up a flyer. We do have flyers or access us via, via the web page and take referrals that way. And the feedback from some of our local uh, community GPs is from a time perspective, perspective they found that a lot more useful because the outcome is invariably the, is quite similar it's the same they're still going to get a consultation they're still going to get put on you know the various pathways and get given to all the um, access to all the information we would normally give I guess it just frees up the GP to get back to the consulting room and seeing their patients but there are instances where it is is kind of helpful particularly if we're trying to link you know GPs um, uh, specific patients with specialists and that sort of thing so I think it's a case-by-case -case basis but either way, we're happy if it keeps patients out of ED. Fantastic. Um, you mentioned, Lauren, before Hume. Are you referring to the region or the city of Hume? So we're talking about the whole region all the way up to the Aubrey-Wodonga border. So we've um, done a massive piece of stakeholder engagement with the Hume region, um, with their uh, GP, ambulance, um, CEO, urgent care centre, multi-stakeholder representation, what we've tried to basically do is firstly create sort of a priority list of things that they felt as a region they needed us to provide support for, and then subsequently um, looking to see how we can then roll out in a phased rise manner to try and meet some of the things that they think they, they need some help with. So what, an example for that is um, the aged care sector. So they don't have a lot of residential enriched support for that. And so with a lot of this aged care support, you know, aged care work that we've been doing, we've created capacity within our own residential enrich team um, to provide additional support to the Hume region. So now if a patient um, is referred to us uh, from ambulance or from an aged care facility from that area, and we feel that a follow-up call or um, consultation might be needed, we can refer that into our own resi enrich team who'll make contact with that care facility the next day and then either supporting the GP 
or um, other care provider in the region with, with geriatrician support to make sure you know, that that patient is safety netted and receives any other care that they may need. Great. Um, is the service available 24 hours? So I understand it is for COVID positive patients, um, for self-referring patients for non-COVID issues. Yeah, so it is, it's available 24 seven, yeah. Um, yeah, so someone has asked when will the service be expanded? Have you got any idea when that might occur across Victoria? Yes, yeah, so I'm, I don't know if you heard the Premier's announcement. So he gave us some additional funding to expand um, with a view that we're hope, hopefully double size sort of by the end of the year. Um, so uh, yeah, we're hoping to get through um, our Hume work uh, over the next couple of weeks and sort of have a quite an extensive model across the Hume region. Um, we're hoping to be statewide with ambulance. Brad, when would you say? <laughs> Hopefully by September. Um, we're hoping that will be um, that work will be done, and then we'll start looking at additional pieces of work. Um, you know, specifically, we are looking to do some an engagement piece of work in the pediatric space with nurse on call, for example, later this year. So there's there's different pieces of work that we're looking to launch, but I imagine it will probably take us a good probably. I'd say it's all mid next year to get the full model across the state. Great. Um, someone's asked, are all calls via telehealth? Therefore, must a person have a computer or a smartphone or could you have a telephone conversation? So it is a prerequisite that we ask for video and in, we will try and find workarounds where we can. But one of the, the um, statements that we make as you enter the service is that we, we want video health and we really want to have an eye on the problem to give the best possible advice. Um, where sometimes video might break down, for example, we try and use short video clips or um, photos that are that are messaged to us, um, you know, via secure messaging, just to make sure that we actually see what the issue is. But if we don't feel like we've got a good sense of what the problem is um, visually, then generally speaking, we won't offer the advice and the advice will be to default to what they normal uh, what they would normally do, whether they saw their GP or attended a hospital, for example. Okay, no worries. Do patients need a Medicare card? Currently, no. It's under review at the moment. So for COVID, we took out the requirement for Medicare, um, just because we acknowledged the fact that there were a lot of people that were stuck in Australia, and it was through no fault of their own that didn't have a Medicare card. And so we wanted to make sure that we didn't create health inequity. Um, so currently you do not need a Medicare card to access the service, um, but I think there, there have been some concerns raised about our service potentially being abused, and so I think it's under review at the moment. Okay, thank you. Next question. If a GP has attended an RACF and requested ambulance transfer to hospital, will the paramedic re-triage on arrival and use VVED if the resident meets the criteria? Uh, I'm happy to speak to that or if Brad wants to speak to it, but generally, yes. And the reason being is that from our data, we've recognised that there's a lot of patient conditions that we can probably sort out in the home, including bringing residential in -reach and palliative care services into the home. So what we've done through this piece of work with RACER and with um, Brad's team is develop additional pathways that help us essentially deliver some of those care needs more fully in the home. And if we know that we can get access to that pretty quickly. Um, so we know that some, obviously, Eastern, for example, Eastern Hospital has an amazing residential in -reach team. They're extremely responsive. And so if we know that we can get a team out to that residential aged care facility pretty quickly, then we'll, we will endeavor to try to keep that patient in the facility and, and link up those services. Uh, another question, can people with abdominal pain and respiratory tract infections be referred? Yeah, good question. Um, so a lot of the respiratory infections, as I said, a lot of patients have COVID. So we do have a COVID pathway. And because we are seeing early treatment referrals, we do see a lot of respiratory um, patients. We do try and send patients back to respiratory clinics if we think that they need a face-to-face -face assessment. Um, because obviously they've been set up there. We've had really good feedback about that. And obviously that's a much better care pathway um, if they do need proper assess, um, proper clinical assessment or um, investigation. Um, abdominal pain is tricky. Uh, certainly in the northern suburbs, we take the referral more specifically because we can facilitate a direct to um, short stay admission pathways where we basically 
uh, get the ambulance or patient to basically go straight to short stay and we've already assessed what we think the underlying issue is and what the most likely investigations are the patient will have an assessment and then those investigations will be started very rapidly but they are very I'm, I'm sure many GPs will tell you in telehealth abdominal pain is quite a difficult um, territory to to be treating because it is kind of high risk and obviously we know a lot of patients have the potential to have significant pathology what we will do sometimes if patients self present with um, abdo pain then is just kind of I guess risk um, time assess the necessity for how urgently they need that assessment so you know if patients had tummy pain for half an hour um, you know we might be a little bit more um, willing to tell them to wait until the morning and go see their GP if it's sort of nine o'clock at night but obviously if there's any concerns or we're worried then you know, we'll almost always default to coming in it's just such a tricky condition to manage. Thank you um, someone's asked can fracture be discussed? Yes, again, um, one of the reasons we've kept uh, self-presentation at um, or a sort of northern Cedric at the moment is because we, we recognise how difficult it is to expand our self-presentation arm across the state, recognising that we, what we're delivering to our patients is, is quite complex. So we can, for example, organise um, radiology for our patients in the north and organise for one of our um, virtual doctors to follow that up, assess the you know, assess if there is a fracture or not, and then organize the treatment that may be needed. Where it becomes quite tricky is trying to work out how, how do we do that in other areas with less radiology services or different providers, private providers, public providers. So that's a piece of work we're undertaking, a scoping piece of work we're undertaking at the moment to look at how do we create, you know, that piece of work. But certainly, you know, Brad's team phoned me and they had a four-year-old that had had a bit of a foosh and the, the arm was a bit tender, but not obviously deformed. It was nine, 10 o'clock at night. I'd feel very comfortable saying, take some Panadol and some Nurofen, splint that, and then get them to come into the hospital first thing in the morning or see their GP for an X-ray. So there, there, there are some things that we will manage if it's if it seems relatively simple and, you know, we're, we're not concerned about a neurovascular compromise. Thank you. Someone else has asked for clarification. If a patient self-refers, does it happen that then the Northern Health Hospital rings them to assess them and then triage them? How does that work? Sure, so if a patient self-refers, they fill in an electronic form. And when they submit that form, that automatically comes up on a dashboard that we've created. Our clerical staff will put them into our tracking board for next patient waiting to be seen. But when they submit that electronic form as the patient, they automatically get sent a link um, that allows them to enter the virtual waiting room. So they'll be in the first be in the nurse's virtual waiting room and the nurse will see the next one waiting to be seen, as you would normally do if you were standing in a queue waiting to be seen in ED. And they will then, when, when they're ready, pick that patient up and do, a, again, a video consultation. Now, they're not using Australian triage rules. They're actually um, using a telehealth decision tool called Odyssey which has been validated in both the UK and within Australian context as a safe um, telehealth decision tool. Um, in fact, Ambulance Australia, uh, sorry, Victoria use it. Uh, I think Tassie and South Australia um, ambulance services use it as well. Um, I guess we kind of feel that given that we're using a tele-decision tool that, that is validated plus video conferencing, plus we're using quick care trained nurses that have triage experience, it's quite a safe um, model. Um, and they're quite good, you know, using all those tools, they then decide whether the patient is suitable to come through to our telehealth waiting room or whether they need to send them into hospital or back to community care. Thank you. Another question, are the VVED doctors ED consultants, registrars, GPs or other? Okay, so the, most of them are uh, emergency physicians, paediatric emergency physicians, paediatricians and GPs. So we have a massive mixture. Um, we also have nurse practitioners, as I mentioned before, and um, we've brought on specialized nurse practitioners, so ED nurse practitioners, aged care nurse practitioners, palliative care nurse practitioners, and pediatric nurse practitioners, as various groups ha um, have grown in presentation numbers, and as we've identified sort of gaps in the system. So for example, particularly late at night, we, we tend to get a lot of referrals for help for palliative care, and so hence we've brought in a palliative care nurse to try and help facilitate community-based you know, palliative care to come into facilities or even the home and um, administer palliative care. 
And I guess if someone was interested in working with you, they'd contact <laughs> Northern Health about that. Yeah, so just email me your CV, please. And then let me know if you've got any particular questions. Um, and then, yeah, we've got processes for getting the ball rolling um, if you're interested in working. Great, thank you. Um, someone has asked, how long has this virtual AD been running for? And has its implementation affected the health outcomes for patients in a positive or negative way? Yeah, that's a really complex question. So, I mean, the first part of that is pretty easy. Um, so we've been running since October 2020. So I think that's, goodness me, we're coming up to almost two years. Um, I, I guess from, I guess we have to look at it from two components. If you look at health outcomes, health outcomes for the patients currently in ED that are getting delayed access to care because of ramping or because they, you know, because of bed block. And I guess the health, uh, health outcomes of patients who are actually going through the virtual ED. So, I mean, I guess from our perspective, the patients that are going through the virtual ED, about 40% of them we outright discharge. And we're not really surprised. It's generally category four, category five kind of patients that ordinarily probably didn't need to go into an ED anyway. So we're really happy they're contacting us in the virtual ED if it means that they didn't come into actual ED. Um, about 20% get directed into hospital. Um, because they still need hospital level care. And then there's a group of about 40% um, that do need some level of sort of subacute care. And then it's about helping to facilitate access to those care pathways. So an example would be, you know, we might have a patient who contacts us and um, perhaps they've got a, a, a problem that needs to be seen by a plastic surgeon. And we would then, you know, phone their relative health service, speak to the plastic surgeon, discuss the issue, and then try and see if we can facilitate a sort of semi-urgent outpatient appointment. We may, for example, link a patient um, into a HIT service, um, other sort of rapid review clinics. Uh, we, for example, have access to a back pain clinic that our um, allied team set up specifically for the virtual model. So, you know, I think for that, those 40%, they're getting a pretty good deal because a lot of them are getting streamlined care to the care, you know, to the specialists that they need um, without actually needing to come to the you know, through the ED. Um, with respect to the patients in ED, you know, obviously if we don't have patients standing in queues, you know, if you don't have 10 patients waiting in line, they don't need to be there while the person with crushing chest, you know, chest pain is standing at the back. Well, then that's obviously better for the patient with the crushing chest pain if he's getting triaged, assessed into the cubicle that he needs quicker. So, I mean, the whole project was, um, I guess, developed to, to try around the idea of ED diversion and trying to make sure that the right patients are coming into ED so that we can, so we can best address the needs of those that acutely need ED care and try and see if we can keep out those patients that don't need to be coming into ED by linking them into um, other care providers. And we recognize that a lot of patients come into ED because they just don't know. So a lot of what we do in the virtual ED is actually education. And it's just saying, you know, this problem is a problem and we recognize that you're very worried about it, but that's not a problem that needs to be sorted out, you know, at this time of day um, that can actually wait until tomorrow or a couple of days if you do X, Y, and Z for the next couple of days. And patients find that very reassuring. Um, we often spend a lot of time just talking to them. We have um, Sometimes talking is the best medicine, I guess, and giving them that education is ex extremely valuable. And um, a lot of the feedback we get is just because we do invest that time in the patients um, and give them, you know, give them the time that they need to understand their condition and their care needs. Thank you. Another question, do patients in regional Victoria have to wait to use this service until it is properly rolled out in their regional area? And can both COVID and non-COVID patients use this service? So COVID patients in regional serve, in regional areas can use it. And the reason we've, we've, we've done that is because we've already established really good networks and pathways with all the COVID positive teams in the regional services. So we know how to navigate patients who might be more unwell that need to perhaps go into a medium pathway into their COVID positive pathway team. We know how to refer patients back to GP. That's, that's not an issue. And we know how to also navigate early treatment teams within the regional areas. Where it gets quite complex for non-COVID conditions is, you know, without doing the background work and the scoping work, how do we, for that 40% of patient that needs access to, I guess, subacute care, how do we recreate what we've created around the northeast suburbs? 
how do we you know organize an outpatient appointment perhaps a hit pathway etc and so that's the kind of scoping work that we're doing with the regions at the moment so you know we've literally um we're literally going urgent care center by urgent care center ed by ed through the hume region so that we make sure that we know what we can and can't send to the various urgent care centers but also know how we can navigate patients into you know, subacute services in those regions without having to go through their major EDs. Thank you. Now, there's another question about Medicare patients, but I think you've answered that. So it is currently available for non-Medicare patients and there's no fees charged at all, is there? No, not at the moment. No. So how long would a standard consultation be for a VED or, or you know, within the range of times? I think it's very dependent on the complexity of patients. Um, obviously, uh, I'm a pediatric emergency physician by background, so I mostly do, you know, pediatric patients and a consultation in VVED probably takes me anywhere between 15 to 20 minutes, according to how complex it is. So I can usually see three or four patients an hour, but like every pediatric patient, you know, you get the family with the crying infant or, you know, maybe it's a constipation family and then, you know, you're going to invest a bit more time. You know, and that we can go through a broad spectrum all the way to our palliative care consultation. So if, a, you know, if an aged care facility or a home contacts us with a palliative care patient, that can sometimes take anywhere up to an hour, an hour and a half for that specific clinician to navigate. We don't mind that. We expect that overall, you know, some of us will be rapidly going through some patients and other, you know, other clinicians are investing that time to try and see if they can um, facilitate at home care. Thank you. Um, another question, is there a GP secondary or co-consult offering with this service? Uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Um, can GPs contact you directly to have a consultation about a patient? Absolutely, so you just go through the healthcare professional pathway and that'll take you straight into what we call our consult waiting room. Um, and then based on age, somebody will pick you up. So generally, if you've declared that you're from an aged care facility, then, um, or you know, you've got an elderly patient, then usually one of the aged care clinicians will pick you up. If you're pediatric, one of the pediatric clinicians will pick you up. Otherwise, one of the general emergency physicians will pick you up. Okay. And I think we've just about covered most of the questions that are relevant, Lauren. So um, if there's no more questions, I think that perhaps we can finish early. So I'd just like to say on behalf of Eastern Melbourne PHN, thank you so much um, to Lauren, Ariana and Brad um, for your presentation tonight. We'll have the recording available on our website and send it out to everybody. Um, and hopefully uh, we'll hear from you again sometime in the future. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today.